I heard that. What? Stay up, K. Who? Who? Don't die. Nigga, that wasn't me. Trying to act all caring and sensitive. Yeah, that was you. Now, this is a movie that I watched more when I was younger than I did at a big age. So seeing it now made me look at Kane, Ronnie, and his homeboys a lot differently. Though this is your typical hood story of the 90s, what makes it different is how Kane had people around him trying to guide him out of the life and show him that there was a better way to live. But child, he was running in the opposite direction the majority of the time. But anyway, while watching this movie, I noticed a lot of things and you know it's time to talk about it. So let's get into it. Before the movie officially starts, we meet two of our main characters, Kane and O-Dog. They're in this corner store and at first glance by the store owners, they are already presumed to be thieves. They are followed from every corner of this store by this lady all the way up to the register. And then when they finally buy what they came for, this guy doesn't even want to give them their change. And for him to be so scared, why did he think it was a good idea to say this? I feel sorry for your mother. what you say about my mama? And then it goes from zero to a hundred real quick when old dog lists out his inner bishop. It turns out it was only six dollars in the register, but lucky for old dog, there was more cash in the store owner's pockets. Now, all of this was happening way too fast for Kane, and he was over it at this point. Fuck that girl! Child, they came to this store to get some drink and left out cold blooded murderers. Well, old dog was the murderer and Kane was just an accessory to it. But anyway, the movie officially starts. It's here that we get a backstory for Kane. We see him as a little boy chilling outside with the neighborhood fellas until his mama catches him and swiftly tells him to get his ass in the house. Remember this guy, his name is Purnell and we'll see him later. Kane's mama was a drug addict and his dad, Tat, was a drug dealer. Again bad combination but as tad is playing cards with the fellas he takes this as the opportunity to ask this guy about his motherfucking money but child this guy starts talking king shit to tat and walks right into his own demise yeah, but i'm supposed to be scared now because you got a pistol motherfucker i told you i'll pay your monkey ass when i feel like it better suck my dick when the other men try to talk some sense into Tat and calm him down, he shuts that shit down real quick. Fuck you tripping off of? You owe me some money, motherfucker! Hell no, but here you go. <laughs> anyway, Kane witnesses this, and unfortunately for him, this isn't the last time he sees his dad kill someone or do bad things like this. As we can just about guess, Kane had a traumatic childhood. We fast forward to a few years later. Kane is now graduating high school, barely, but hey, a diploma is a diploma. After leaving his last, last day of school, he goes to see Pernell's baby's mama, Ronnie, and Pernell's son, Anthony. Pernell was the guy that little Kane was talking to at the beginning of the film. Kane goes to check on Ronnie and Anthony every once in a while to make sure they're straight and don't need anything. But we shall learn later that he's checking on more than he should. But anyway, we go to Kane back in the hood where his grandparents live. We learn that his dad was killed when he was 10 and his mom later died of an overdose. So he's lived with his grandparents ever since. His grandparents are so proud of him for now, giving him all the love. We then fast forward to Kane pulling up to a graduation party with his cousin, Harold. It's here that Kane learns that the activities at the corner store a couple of days ago have been passed around via a videotape taken by O-Dog. And O-Dog's crazy ass is the one responsible for sharing the evidence of their crimes. Well, his crime, but do loved living on the edge. You already know this is gonna bite him in the ass later though. We also meet their homeboys, Awax and Sharif. Later on, they all head out to get a bite to eat. Kane and Harold ride together while the others go to the gas station first before they head to the same restaurant. 
And maybe Kane and Harold should have followed everybody else because they get caught up at the light. Apparently, Harold had beef in these streets, and instead of bringing Kane down with him, he tells him to get out the car, but Kane wasn't fast enough because they shoot Harold and him at the same damn time. Old Dog and the other guys were close enough to see and save Kane, but Harold was a goner. Sharif opts to stay with Harold, not wanting to leave his body out on the streets, and gets left by the others. That was dope of him not to want to leave him there, shows that Sharif valued life unlike his other friends, specifically Kane, but we'll get to that. Child, they busted through the hospital to save Kane, and baby Tyron was acting for his life in this scene. He does these types of scenes really well. Anyway, Kane survives the shooting, and he's even surprised he made it, but does this event push him to be more intentional with his life? We shall see, but Ronnie comes to the hospital to take Kane home as a favor to his grandparents. When he gets back home, his grandparents try to up the life talks, trying desperately to redirect Kane and his homeboy Old Dog into a brighter, less deadly path, but they weren't trying to hear that shit. My grandpa was always coming at us with that religion, and every time, he would go in one ear and out the other. Child, everybody's grandparents had this picture, or the one with Jesus' hands were outstretched, or the footprints one. That's when the elders were eldering. <laughs> but Cain's grandfather asked him a very important question that Cain didn't know how to properly answer. Do you care whether you live or die? I don't know. Wrong answer, my guy. You recently cheated death, and you don't know? Child, but anyway, Kane and Old Dog talk about the night of Kane's shooting and make fun of how each other were freaking out about him getting shot. I heard that shit. What? Stay up, Kane! Ooh, ooh. Don't die! Shit, nigga, that wasn't me. Trying to act all caring and sensitive. Yeah, that was you. But Old Dog eventually tells Kane the true reason he came to see him. Turns out they found out where the guy that shot Kane and his cousin hang out. And you already know what they are planning to do. But in the meantime, tell me why Old Dog is showing even more people the video of his crime. This dude has got to be the dumbest criminal ever. Like I said, on some bishop type stuff. Everybody is chilling over Chauncey's house, preparing for their hit. Why am I just now noticing that Too Short was in this movie? I'm super late. Anyway, they gave this fool some heavy artillery, way heavier than he can possibly handle. This dude was pretty reckless with it, too. Hey, man, this what the yo, police man, yo, man, what doing, man, nigga, man, man. So later on, Old Dog, Kane, and AWAX head over to the Ops Hangout spot. Old Dog brings up his tape one more again. And at this point, Kane is over it and tells him flat out to stop showing off the damn tape. I mean, it's really common sense as of why showing off the tape is not the best idea, but somehow it's going straight over Old Dog's head. But they finally make it there, and as suspected, their ops were there, getting on this girl's nerves. They wasted no time getting shit started, though. And when they pulled up, dudes was spooked, and this girl was steady screaming, Girl, it's called duh, and mind your business damn but what was so crazy is that this guy thought for a split second that he had a friend nope hey homie you need some help yeah it was a wrap for those guys but as we've come to know with these type of movies every action has a reaction and it's coming don't even trip so the next day kane goes over to see ronnie and anthony drop off some funds and hang out for a little bit as he's talking to them in the kitchen, he tries to excuse Anthony's developing cussing habit that Ronnie wasn't going for. I'll whoop your ass! Anthony, what did I tell you about your mouth? Why, why are you tripping? Later on, as Kane and Anthony are playing the game, Kane puts his gun on the dresser to get more comfortable as they play. Anthony asks to see it, and Kane's silly ass lets Anthony hold and actually fire the gun, though it wasn't loaded, and Ronnie catches them. Baby, I would have kicked him clean at the house. Like, we just talked about this, and then you gonna let my son hold a gun? You gotta go. Ronnie tries to talk some sense into him, more than I would at that point, but it's still going right over his head. Ronnie found the money he planted in her room, and that's what initially prompted her to go into Anthony's room to confront Kane. 
Kane tells her that he feels like he owes Parnell for all he did for him and, and that's why he looks out for them. But Ronnie doesn't want to hear that. Ronnie tells him that he's headed down the same path as Parnell and he needs to change before it's too late. Later on, Old Dog, Awax, and Chauncey are hanging out together at Chauncey's house. Chauncey gets a visit from this guy and this whole interaction is funny as hell. Basically, this guy wants Chauncey to get him a car so he can pull an insurance scam. And this is light work for Chauncey, so he tells him the time and the place to meet him. Be here tomorrow night about, uh, about 10.30. Are you sure you meet tomorrow night? So Old Dog and Kane go off to the parking garage to get the car for Chauncey. And they barely make it into the parking garage before the security guard calls the cops. So they had an even smaller window to pull this off. They get the car, but unfortunately for them, they meet the cops at the exit of the garage and had to make a run for it. Child, they really thought they were hiding until they released this dog on them. They get arrested and go to jail. This was Kane's first time going to jail and even this didn't deter him from living life on the edge. Instead, he saw this as a rite of passage. And then this scene. You know that video that cute dog has been showing everybody and they mama? The cops have heard about it and now they got it out for Kane and Old Dog. They are interrogated by this guy and Kane is shook. You would have thought all the dudes he hung out with, including Parnell, would have prepared him for this. And this guy is calmly getting him caught up in lie after lie. But you bought the bottle of beer at 12.15. Yeah, it was 12.15, exactly. If I'm not mistaken, it was now you see something? You done fucked up, you know that, don't you? And this interrogation must have really stressed Kane out because he was chained to the toilet for a hot minute. Come on, brother, you wasn't there long enough to catch the HIV. Fuck <coughs> you. But they head out to take Kane to go pick up his car. Stacy and Cherie try to convince Kane to go to Kansas with them again to no avail. His happy ass is still trying to stay in LA. For what reason, I don't know. Stacy brings up how Kane's trying to stay for Ronnie, but Kane swiftly shuts that down, being that she's Parnell's ex girl. We learn that Parnell is in jail for life without parole. So, really, what can he do or say? But at this moment, Kane is not with it, or at least that's what he wants these guys to think. But Kane gets his car and he's ready to ride the streets of LA, but he's missing an important accessory for his whip. And this unsuspecting fool is gonna give it to him. Child, Kane follows this guy to the burger spot to jack him for his rims, and this scene was hilarious. I want your motherfucking Dayton's and your motherfucking stereo, and I'll take a double burger with cheese. What? I'm noticing all the GTA San Andreas references in this movie, but Kane gets the rims he was looking for and a free meal. A win is a win, and if Kane wasn't already into some shit, he takes it one step further and starts mixing and selling drugs, like father, like son. But baby, Kane was too ready to hit the streets. He pulled up in the Mustang, sitting nice, and he didn't even get to park his whip before he spotted his next conquest. This girl, Elena, is gonna get him in a world of trouble later. We'll get to that in a little bit. Later, while the guys are playing dominoes and talking shit, Sharif's dad, Mr. Butler, comes up to chat with them. And Sharif is happy about this because he finally has someone on his side when it comes to trying to convince his friends to get out of the street life. When Kane asked Sharif this, I lived for his answer. Why you always tripping, man? You got a father, man. And you got a grandmother and a grandfather. And I'm pretty sure they tell you everything that my father tell me. But you don't listen anyway, so what's the difference? Facts. Kane had two parental figures who tried their best to lead him in the right direction. And he ignored them every chance he got. But sometime later, Kane comes to see Sharif and his dad. And again, they try to convince him to leave LA for Kansas. Kane still didn't want any parts. All I'm saying is survive. All right. What was so crazy is that Kane's grandparents tried their best to instill some values into him, but it was always a no-go. It was clear that they cared about him and his future. However, when Mr. Butler talked to him, he was able to receive what he was saying because in his words, he felt like they cared. So did he not feel like his grandparents cared? I mean, what more did they need to do or say? 
but the conversation with Mr. Butler works and it actually got Kane to listen and think for once. Later, Sharif and Kane are riding around and talking. Child, he was sitting mighty close to the wheel. <laughs> but anyway, Sharif asks Kane if he met up with old girl from the barbecue, Elena, and it turns out Kane already slept with her and insists he used the condom. Sharif tells him that he heard about other dudes possibly talking to old girl too and warns him, but Kane claims to have it all under control. But later on that night, they are pulled over by the cops, and of course, these cops give them a hard time. They pretty much kidnap and beat them, then decide to drop them off in enemy territory, or what they assume to be enemy territory, but thankfully the so-called enemies ended up being good people who take them to the hospital to get care. We go to Ronnie and Anthony who are getting ready for bed. Anthony asks why the police beat Kane and Sharif, and Ronnie is honest with him. She tells him that there are hateful people in the world and those hateful people chose to hurt Kane and Sharif. Anthony then asks if Kane is gonna die and Ronnie tries to ease his fears by telling him that he's not. The next day, Ronnie goes to see Kane in the hospital. She tries to encourage him to cheer up, but Kane is just not with it. I ain't got shit to smile about. You alive, ain't you? <laughs> yeah, and who says that's good? This dude is just... <laughs> He's cheated death twice already, and he's still ungrateful. Anyway, Ronnie tells Kane that she's landed a job, and Kane doesn't even pretend to be happy or excited for her. She goes on to tell him that the job is in Atlanta and tries to encourage him to go with her. Then Kane acts to this. Why are you so worried about me? Why shouldn't I be? Kane isn't with it at first, but he starts to think about it more and more as the night goes on. He considers how much he cares for Ronnie and Anthony and how he didn't want Anthony to grow up like he did. But anyway, we go to Ronnie's going away party and the whole crew is there. And Ronnie's regulating per usual, trying to count the beer, making sure it's some left for her boo. I mean, still friend at this point, Kane, and making sure certain people don't smoke in her home. Child, it's a mess. But later on, Ronnie calls Kane inside to talk to him. They couldn't even make it to the room before Chauncey tries to shoot his shot at Ronnie. And you already know Kane wasn't going for that. Yo, Ronnie, I'm gonna catch you later though. Kane, me and you, baby. Talk blocking, motherfucker. But when they make it to her room, she asks him if he was gonna leave with them, and Kane is still dragging his feet and talking shit like this. Ain't nothing gonna change in Atlanta. I mean, I'm still gonna be black. Ronnie goes on to tell him that Anthony asked her if he was gonna die and goes on to ask him again if he was gonna leave with them. This time, he decides to give it serious thought, which gets Ronnie so excited that she kisses Kane. He tries to resist it at first, but you already know what happened after that. Yeah. This is a meme. This is not me. <laughs> I had a few people ask that. But that's all it took for Kane to have a little chip on his shoulder about Ronnie. He was whipped. Baby Chauncey tries to shoot his shot yet again, but Kane was not going for it, and he pulled one of his daddy's moves. This would prove to be another mistake, and it set some events in motion. Later that night, Kane gets a call that he really wasn't trying to get. Elena called to tell Kane that she was pregnant, and you already know what Kane had to say about that. Well, what the fuck you telling me for? It ain't mine. He insists that since he had the condom on extra tight, it couldn't possibly be his. But dude, if it was on extra tight, anyway. But Elena goes on to ask him an important and relevant question. You man enough to take a life? You ain't man enough to take care of one? Child, Kane done pissed off Chauncey, and now that tape that old dog was passing along is about to be made even more public and available to the cops. Bad decisions. Anyway, Ronnie and Kane go to see Parnell to say goodbye before they leave for Atlanta. Ronnie was over it as soon as she got there. She really only came out of obligation, not because she cares about him, especially since Kane is her new boo. Parnell asks to talk to Kane. Turns out this is the first time Kane's come to see Parnell. That's crazy since he always talked about what all Parnell had done for him. He couldn't even spare 15 minutes to see him. But Parnell tells him that he approves of him and Ronnie and encourages both of them to leave LA, take care of Anthony, and give him a better life. Later on, Kane goes to his grandparents' house. He couldn't even get out the car good without Old Dog playing jokes and shit. 
Shortly after, he gets a visit from Elena's cousin. Listen, if you see this guy in a film, you already know it's about to be some fuckery going on. But O Dog and Kane touch him up real quick before Kane's granddaddy comes outside to stop the madness. Child, Kane's grandparents have had enough at this point and basically put him out. And Kane is hurt by this, but I believe his grandparents made the right choice. Kane didn't seem like he wanted to change, and his actions were going to eventually bring trouble their way. You can teach a child the ways of the world and how to live and be good, but it's up to them to use those teachings. And at that point, at least for them at that moment, Kane was a lost cause. Around this time, Kane learns that him and Old Dog's tape has made its way to the investigators, and they're now looking for him and Old Dog. They also learn who's responsible for the tape getting out, and now Old Dog has it out for Chauncey. Child, all his crazy ass had to do was keep the tape to himself in the first place. He out here showing it to everybody like it was America's Funniest Home Video Submission. Like, what the hell? But anyway, <laughs> we finally get to the day that Kane and Ronnie are leaving LA for Atlanta. The guys have come to help them pack up and say goodbye. Meanwhile, Elena's cousin and his hurt ego are off to take care of Kane. Elena tries to talk some sense into her cousin, but he wasn't trying to hear it. It was personal for him at this point. We go back to Kane, who's talking to Anthony, and we start going back and forth from Elena's cousin back to Kane, and he gets closer to Ronnie's house. We see him creep up, and nobody sees him coming. Sharif and Kane are hit instantly. Kane tries desperately to get to Anthony to shield him from the bullets, taking even more shots as he gets closer to him. Stacy and Ronnie eventually run outside to find Sharif gone and Kane clinging to life. Karma spun the block super fast for Kane. We see his life literally flash before his eyes and now, now that he doesn't even have the option to change, he values life and has a definite answer to the question his grandfather asked him earlier in the film. My grandpa asked me one time, if I care whether I live or die, yeah I do, now it's too late. And Kane is gone. And that's pretty much the end of the movie. And here are my final thoughts. Let's just say it, Kane was a product of his own demise. Yes, Kane had two parents who introduced him to the streets, drugs, and violence from an early age, and a mentor who continued to lead him down the same path after the loss of his parents. But Kane also had his grandparents, Sharif, Mr. Butler, and Ronnie trying to show him something different. I understand that the kind of life he was living was all he knew and what he was brought up in for the most part, but Cain had every opportunity to change for himself. He was stubborn, didn't want to listen to his grandparents because he didn't want to hear any religious talk, didn't want to hear Sharif because he didn't want to hear what he was talking about, didn't want to hear Ronnie because he thought leaving LA wouldn't do him any better child the only person he halfway listened to was mr butler i kept wondering throughout the film like what more did he need to hear to wake up do have plenty of people around him trying to talk sense to him but he wasn't hearing them i mean this guy cheated Dell twice saw his cousin get killed in front of him saw his mentor get life in prison yet and still he was fine with living how he was living so many warnings before destruction that he never took seriously. We hate to see it. And this whole running situation, like, how old was she? Matter of fact, how old was she when she got with Parnell? Not Kane being the cleanup man. <laughs> Let me stop. But that whole thing was so weird to me. You pursuing your mentor's girl and him just being fine with it. I don't know. And let's talk about old dog's ass. It's bad enough that you went to the corner store and killed the owners, but then you slick got away with it. Even have the evidence of your crime locked down and your simple ass goes around showing it to everybody. Like I said before, old dog was on some bishop type stuff. It was only a matter of time before it came back to them. Honestly, old dog should have been trying to leave with Kane cause they were both wanted men. Either the streets or jail was gonna get them if they stayed. And unfortunately for Kane, it was the streets. It was so sad to see Kane actually value his life and the people in it much too late. Kane lacked faith, I guess, or maybe he was just wondering. No end goal in sight. Child, I don't know. 
Oh, and one more thing. This movie made me want to play San Andreas again. If you know, you know. Anyway, y'all, that's it for this review. It will be available on Spotify per usual. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time. As for the next review, it's Halloween time, y'all. So we know we got to do it right. So all I'm going to say is 2001 legendary rapper, legendary foxy actress, and another actress who doesn't age, who has legendary family ties. Yup, that one. Bye.